Hi there. Welcome to this week's episode of Waste 360's Unpacking Recycling with Charlotte. My name is Charlotte Dreisen and I am really excited to be here today with you talking about fire in solid waste and how we can prevent fires in our trash and recycling stream, how we can all manage them when they do occur, and really how we can prevent them in the first place. We are just coming off of one of the highest fire years ever in 2021 with more than 367 fires occurring in solid waste management facilities. Uh, in between the U.S. and Canada. And in 2022, we had the single highest recorded month on the books as a whole in May, just a couple of months ago, with more than 49 fires recorded in U.S. and Canadian facilities, which is much higher than the running average of about 28 a month. Um, so we are in a really hot time of the year and a really hot year or two with fires. Um, with climate change, we will only be seeing more of this. So a really good time to pause and think about what's going on in the space. Where I am in Washington, D.C., we've been thinking a lot about this in particular because one of our two publicly owned and operated transfer stations, which is where all trash and recycling gets brought before it heads to its end destination, um, unfortunately burned down um, about this time last year in late July. Uh, so in D.C., we've suffered some really crippling effects of fire in facilities when not managed um, as well as they could be and uh, having material in the stream in the first place that's really ripe to combust and start a fire. Um, so where can fires take place in the trash and recycling space? The answer is really anywhere along the supply chain. Fires can occur in bins if someone flicks a lit cigarette into it, whether one's own bin or a bin on a street corner. Um, they can occur in a truck if, say, a battery is compacted or um, that combusted material is added to a whole truckload of dry, dusty, paper and trash in general. And then, of course, fires can happen once we're at a facility like a transfer station or a recycling facility or MRF um, or at a scrap metal yard, plastic or paper processor, a landfill, a waste to energy facility, anywhere where a material load might go from that point forward. They happen in all of those places, less frequently in organics recycling facilities, for example, than than those others. But really anywhere that trash or recycling or organics can end up, a fire can happen. Um, and they, they really can occur in a lot of different ways. They can start by smoldering and kind of slowly brewing in a trash or recycling pile on a tip floor at, at a transfer station or MRF. Or it can happen in an instant with acute combustion or explosion. They happen in both ways. They can also happen really deep-seated in the core of a big, you know, four-story pile of trash at a transfer station, or they can occur on the surface. You have to manage those in different ways. It's much easier to put out a fire if it occurs right on the edge of a recycling or trash pile, much harder if it is right deep in the central core where there's a few stories of material on top of it that you have to you know, wet and get out of the way first. Um, so it really, it really can impact how you need to manage that material and just how bad the fire might be once it's combusted. But of course, at a transfer station or processing facility, we're often dealing with really dry, dusty conditions as a whole, which is why dust management is such a big, important part of fire prevention. Those conditions really tend to feed a fire when they do start, unfortunately. And we also want to be thinking about clearing our facilities out and not letting enormous amounts of material accumulate beyond the threshold that's safe for a given facility. We all, of course, want to try and clear out all of the trash and recycling from, let's say, a transfer station every day when it comes through, but unfortunately, we know in practice that doesn't always happen. When we are in a facility too, we also want to keep materials separated. If you have space for two two-story trash piles, better to keep trash that way in a transfer station for fire risk rather than one four-story pile. It is much harder for someone to, with a fire extinguisher, reach the, the top surface level of a pile like that if they notice something combusting, um, if it's four stories up relative to it just being two stories down. So when we are thinking about facility management, we want to be thinking about all employees in the facility keeping an eye out for smoldering and smoke starting to take place, an early warning sign. And we also want to be wanting to think about steam. You know, when it's hot, moist material releases steam. We want to be thinking about how that differs from smoke, always keeping an eye from both, though. And we always wanting to be want to be thinking about folks having ready access to a fire extinguisher. A really logical policy is for folks to give any sign of fire one shot with a fire extinguisher, and if unable to eliminate the fire with that one attempt with a fire extinguisher, calling 911 to leave it to the professionals and evacuating from the facility to ensure that any injury to workers doesn't take place. Um, 
in addition, we want we want to be thinking about basic and advanced technology that we can employ. Most facilities will have really basic, at least really basic sprinkler systems and smoke alarms, but there is really exciting advanced technology available to us these days where advanced sensors and cameras can identify the first signs of fires and with targeted high propulsion, really high velocity, send water and foam solutions to that location on a tip floor or in a facility to, to put out fire as soon as it starts. And not only do these cameras work during the daytime, but they can also work at night using that infrared technology, which is really important knowing that with climate change, our nighttime temperatures aren't cooling to as low as they used to. They tend to stay higher, cooling off less from the high daily temperatures each day. Um, so an, another really important piece. But why are fires happening in trash and recycling facilities in the first place? Well, a lot of the reason is that we have a huge amount of material and it's of unpredictable varieties. So not only do we have items in the trash and recycling stream that we don't want there that, you know, programs ask folks to not put there that unfortunately make their way in, but we also just have a lot of different kinds of stuff all together. And they're all together in very hot environments, especially here during fire season, as well as experiencing a lot of movement in the facility due to equipment being moved, conveyor belts being moved, as well as compaction and compression. So when we think about, you know, like, let's say a battery that might be really ripe to start a fire. It's one thing if it is sitting on the very top of a load and it's intact, maybe it won't end up starting a fire. But if it is in the middle center core of a trash pile and a lot of weight is on top of it, many, many tons of weight is on top of it, maybe then under that amount of weight and in that amount of heat, it would start to, to cause an issue. So we want to be thinking about both material that we are concerned about in and of itself, as well as material that, you know, might not normally be an issue. For instance, like a mirror in a landfill in the Midwest just this summer um, had a pretty debilitating fire go on for uh, most of a day, several, several hours that was started by a mirror that was discarded at the surface of a landfill, refracting with the sunlight, creating a fire. So mirrors aren't something that are expressly prohibited from our curbside solid waste management programs typically, but in the right conditions can start a fire as well. So we want to be thinking about kind of those wacky materials and instances as well as things like butane and propane tanks that we definitely don't want on the curbside trash and recycling program but totally make their way in on occasion. My very first visit to a MRF back in the day I was standing next to the conveyor belt material is being tipped onto it and within 30 seconds a propane tank tumbled down. It is really easy to think about how that could lead to a fire at a transfer station, in a trash truck, at a MRF, you name it, at a scrap metal yard. Um, we also want to think about things like pool chemicals and fertilizers and high pressure items like aerosol cans or cigarette lighters. And then, of course, we have batteries, which are our really big concern and one of the fastest growing, you know, items of concern in the trash stream and recycling streams as a whole. Lithium batteries in particular that generate their own oxygen are of most concern. Um, whether they are intact or damaged, um, they can be a really big risk. And one of the concerning pieces in particular is that they are increasing in our waste stream tremendously. Um, they have over recent years, over the past decade, and between 2021 and 2030, we anticipate that the market will grow more than threefold. So we know that lithium batteries are a challenge right now in trash and recycling. When we have you know, a tripling of the amount of them in the waste stream, we know they are going to be even tougher for us to deal with. Lithium batteries come in kind of two general categories, lithium primary batteries, which are in things like medical devices and hearing aids and watches and calculators, as well as lithium ion batteries that are in e-bikes and power tools and a lot of handheld electronics and toys. They are in a lot of the consumer goods and items that we all use day to day. Sometimes they're easy to remove and pop out of that item. Sometimes they're really tough to remove. A lot of times someone might not even make the connection that a battery is in an item. For instance, like a Hallmark card that plays music. Um, those have lithium batteries and can be highly combustible. If someone tosses that paper card into a recycling bin, thinking, you know, wanting to do the right thing and recycle that paper, but not making the connection that a battery might be inside of it, that is, you know, really ripe for, for a fire once at a facility. 
So once a fire starts, what needs to happen? Um, well, we always want to have fire extinguishers on hand for folks to, to hopefully deal with it as soon as um, as fire emerges. If it's in a truck, you know, folks pulling aside and getting to an empty parking lot and unloading that material to use a fire extinguisher on it is probably the best course of action. Ideally, a parking lot that's owned by the city or the company at hand um, rather than someone else's. But of course, mitigating risk to, to workers and um, to equipment is a big priority. Best to have to repay a few parking spots with material that had been put out with the fire extinguisher if it was combusting rather than losing a truck that might be you know worth a quarter of a million to half a million dollars and potentially risking it, uh, worker safety. Um, we also want to think about uh, fire insurance for facilities. Fire insurance is expensive. Premiums are becoming increasingly high. You can get yours down typically by having really smart plans in place and using as advanced technology as you are able to invest in and is uh, logical for you to have on hand. Maybe an organics recycling facility being a category of facility that doesn't typically suffer from as big a fire risk, doesn't need to have all of the most advanced technology at its disposal. But if you are a big major transfer station or MRF in your region, maybe it makes sense for you to, to have some on hand um, and to have that technology installed to, to best deal with the, the issues at, that might crop up at hand. So if a fire requires firefighters being on the scene, it's one of those big fires that workers can't put out themselves. Um, typically, those publicly reported ones that are included in that 367 number from 2021 that occurred in the U.S. and Canada, we then need to be thinking about water use and fire water. Typically, for an industrial fire, we're looking at about 4,000 gallons of water per minute for at least 65 minutes to put out that average industrial fire. But due to the volume of material and the scale of fire that happens at solid waste facilities, we're often talking about a lot more than that. In D.C., for instance, uh, when our transfer station was um, was experiencing a, a fire emergency uh, this time last year. We had it on for about two days. About 100 firefighters, 20 units over a two-day period were required. That really adds up. And when we think about areas that have commercial water use fees that might run five or six dollars, even more sometimes per thousand gallons, we really start to add up a pretty high cost here. So not only do fires and solid waste facilities have you know damage to equipment that need to be replaced sometimes to the structure itself, certainly when any worker injuries come up, but also simply for the water that needs to be used to put out that fire and that, that water foam solution, not to mention the cost of the cleanup or the cost of managing that fire water on the backside. And fire water is what we call the material that's left over. If you use a whole lot of water to put out a fire, there's going to be dissolved material and particulate matter in that remaining liquid solution afterwards that needs to be managed, that needs to be managed safely, knowing that unfortunately a lot of the material in our normal trash and recycling stream, even if it's not a hazardous waste facility, can be pretty hazardous and toxic for human and environmental health. So we've talked a lot about different ways that we can prevent fire in the first place. We can use our basic technology available to us, advanced technology. We can, as folks in solid waste facilities, keep our eyes out for any early signs of fire, um, as well as making sure material is cleared out of facilities on a daily basis, turned when it's in facilities, and kept in smaller separate piles where possible, as opposed to one massive one. But ultimately, we really needing we really need to be thinking about removing the worst of the most problematic risks materials from our curbside trash and recycling streams that we don't want in there in the first place. That typically means thinking about batteries. One important um, element to think about too that's been increasing in the pandemic is the use of antibacterial gel though and gel wipes. Um, those have a really high alcohol content up to 60-70% um, pretty often and that can really act as an accelerant if a spark is flying around or if another material combusts in its vicinity. So that certainly, I, I know I'm not the only one who has, you know, recycled or or thrown away uh, a little travel size antibacterial hand gel during the pandemic. Certainly, those are increasing as well. But batteries are the big, big one that we need to be concerned about. Both kind of those lithium primary and lithium ion batteries, whether they are intact or or damaged as well. If something is damaged, if a battery is damaged at a, at a trash or recycling facility, we want to be exceedingly careful of handling it. Never inhaling the fumes that might be off gassing and getting it into vermiculite or sand at the earliest possibility. Um, if it's intact, um, it can usually be simply kind of taped at its terminals and managed safely according to the facility's plan. But ultimately, we want less batteries in the stream to deal with in the first place. And that really comes down to providing 
folks, whether in single family homes or multifamily homes with easy accessible opportunities to manage their household hazardous waste or bring batteries to a battery recycling drop off. Ideally, of course, we want those batteries recycled, but we know that it is much more prevalent and universal to have a household, household hazardous waste drop off. Uh, I should say that three times fast in the US today than a battery recycling drop off, but hopefully that is changing pretty ubiquitously soon. In Washington, DC, for instance, we have a battery extended producer responsibility EPR program that will be launching in January 1 of 2023 that will require manufacturers of batteries to provide recycling drop offs for those batteries to DC residents about one drop off per 10,000 residents in DC. We have a population of about 700,000. So we'll have much better access than we ever had in the past. The Recycle Act, which was passed by Congress last month, also provides a huge amount of funding to explore best practices, about $10 million for battery recycling, and provides $15 million to explore uh, voluntary labeling guidelines for batteries, knowing that we really need to be conveying to consumers on the package how they can safely and best dispose of their batteries, whether they are a lithium or a non-lithium battery, whether rechargeable or not. We want to make sure that all batteries go to their highest and best use in end of life, ideally to a recycling program if they can, but of course never to a curbside trash and recycling program. It is really exciting to see all of this movement in just the past month or so with battery recycling, knowing that we are going to be facing a huge increase of batteries in our waste stream in the next five, 10 years, not only with the consumer goods that might have lithium batteries, but also with the batteries from EV um, and e-bikes and all of the electric vehicles that we'll have access to increasingly and that will be increasingly used by consumers in the US and, and globally. Um, of course, we're also in the face of dramatically increasing temperatures with climate change, which provides really ripe conditions for fires to start in our trash and recycling streams. Um, a really important time to be thinking about all of this and ensuring our plans at the city level, at the facility level, company level are all as robust as they can be. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode on fire in the trash and recycling stream and zooming out to think about the impacts on the industry as a whole. I hope you've enjoyed it. Feel free to leave any comments or questions right below this video on Waste360's website, or as always, shoot me a tweet on Twitter at Char Dreisen, C-H-A-R-D-R-E-I-Z-E-N, or on Instagram at Char Recycles. See you next time.